Hello and welcome to the 15th episode of the Random Scientist podcast. With Dominic. And Stefan. Today with a special episode or format that we call the Mixed Zone. The Random Scientist podcast. Today we are proud to present a special New Year's episode to you. Where back in the old days, we left our comfy studios and each of us reached out to a scientist of his interest and interviewed him about their work, current work and also about their past work and how today end up at the place they are now. But first of all, I would like to ask Steve, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I have a, li a little cold, but I think it's getting better now. And I hope it's not too much. Uh, you don't notice too much of it. And yeah. I'm settled in the new apartment, so that's great. And yeah, Christmas is over, so we can start the new year. And how about you? I'm also very fine. I'm currently have holidays, and uh, I, but I already want to wish a happy new year to everybody because in the time when you will listen to this episode, it will be already the new year 2017. That's true, that's true. So we both actually will have a little hangover, possibly. Probably. Oh, well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I also want to just uh, clarify why the ep today's episode is actually recorded in English. This is something we actually didn't talk about yet. That's because right. um, my interview that I recorded will be in English because my interview partner is, a nat is not a native English speaker, but we communicate regularly in English. So w with that, we thought, okay, let's just do it really, really special this time. And do it in English because we also anticipate that in the future, if we do interviews with scientists, most of them will probably be in English. So we will stick to the um, to English throughout the whole episode today. I it's hope like, that's fine for everybody, but I think that should be okay. Yeah, I think so. If our English is not too bad, then it should be no problem. I heard it is. I I don't speak English so bad actually. I mean, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> My mama always said, um, so. Enough with the small talk. I think we also then go directly to the news section. And as usually, you prefer, prepared some nice, interesting news you came across the last time. Yeah, exactly. So um, the first thing is about dementia. And um, what I forgot what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and it's about uh, how it could be treatable in the future. So Professor about this trooper or trooper. I guess he is. Hung not Hungarian, but from the Netherlands. No, he's Belgian, actually. And he recently appointed as he was recently appointed as a director of the UK's Dementia Research Institute. And he is optimistic that dementia will be treatable, a treatable condition by 2025. And as a head of this institute, um, this dropper will assemble a multidisciplinary team of doctors, biologists, and engineers and data specialists to expand the studies. And he uh, Uh, likens the promise that uh, with advancements, advancements in the study of this uh, disease, um, similar to like those of HIV, AIDS, and cancer, and in the 1970s and 80s, those diseases were synonymous to death and to a death sentence, um, incurable and uh, yeah, very severe. But today, both of those diseases, uh, if you catch them early they can be manageable and treatable so and he hopes that if uh, yeah more money is spent on dementia and if more work is done there then probably this will also go down the same lines or the same uh, yeah same roads and this will also be treatable if you like see it very very early and then you will be able to treat it so yeah this was the first one And then the second one is really interesting because it's about a bird, the sparrow. And um, yeah, this, this study uh, focuses on, yeah, like there are not only two sexes, but four sexes. Because the white-throated sparrow, um, the bird is common in Eastern and no Eastern North America. And on the head, he is either white or 10 stripes on his head. And um, white stripes, they're made only with 10 stripes and vice versa. So white stripe-headed sparrows will never mate with white stripe sparrows. And yeah, so opposites attract here. And it was a long time puzzling why those 
two different morphs behave so differently. And yeah, on chromosome two, they have like um, a mutation and um, it inverted uh, a long time ago and it created a super gene. So, and this uh, inverted region is now unable to exchange genetic information with the partner chromosome. So um, there is no crossing over possible during meiosis. And those chromosomes diverged um, during evolution and they drive, um, drove uh, different behaviors. So they think um, that this uh, mutation and this uh, inability to perform crossing over um, yeah, led to this uh, behavior. So yeah, this is kind of yeah awkward and really interesting because yeah, you have like um, two colors in this population and yeah, the same color do not mate. So you can talk about this as having four sexes in this um, same species. So this is kind of really interesting. And you can find a link to the scheme and also the description um, in the show notes. And yeah, you can read more of this, but it's uh, very interesting. And the last thing I have is a video from YouTube. And it really? shows... <laughs> yeah, YouTube is very nice. And it shows that oysters can clear nearly 200 liters of water within four hours. So um, when you go to this site and uh, start the video, you will see that they place like oysters in a tank. And the water is like, you cannot see, see through the water. It's really um, dark and with mud and things and algae, I think. They put algae in it. And then they waited for four hours and you can really see the progress of the water clearing. And after three or four hours, you can really um, look through the water again. So it's really nice to see how oysters are able to clean and filter the water um, and make it yeah, make it clean again. So and, really um, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> so they clean the water and then we eat them, right? That's um, yeah, probably how it works. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just saying. I mean, yeah, I can imagine that they that you have to get them from clean water to eat it because if they are polluted and you know have heavy metals in this it's probably not the best thing to eat this yep yeah so these were the three short news that i have but cool yeah wide range of fields yeah very nice but, yeah so then i guess we will just go to the first interview that we have so I in the first so, the first interview was performed by you and you spoke yeah. with mikhail savitsky from the embl and he's head of his own research group and also head of the proteomics core facility there at the EMBL in Heidelberg, right? Exactly. And you spoke with him about how he ended up in the, at the EMBL and about thermoproteomics profiling using mass spectrometry and the perspective about proteomics in general. Yeah. And, and for a, just a, a, a small side mark, I think we actually, we spoke about thermoproteomics profiling already wh a while ago in one of our... Yes, it was the last episode, right? No, it was not the last episode. I think it was was some earlier episode we talked about that. Okay. I introduced, so but not can... his paper. It was the the paper um, of the, the from... Nordlund from the Swedish team. Ah, I see. Yeah, well, uh, we can put the link in the show notes and then you can exactly. go exactly to the this episode. And so, with no further ado, I guess, we just um, got to the interview. The reason why I'm now talking English is that I'm here at the EMBL and I'm sitting in the office of uh, Mikael Savitsky. Mikael Savitsky is um, the head of, a proteomics re of the proteomics research group at EMBL. And he is the head of the proteomics core facility, which means he is my direct boss. <laughs> and he uh, was super. F so first of all, welcome Mika to be Thank here, you. and that you agreed on taking um, some of your valuable time here to um, sit down with me and talk to me. Not always about what is going on in the facility, but also doing some bit of extra work. And um, yeah, um, so. Um, Who is Mikhail, Mikhail Savitsky? So if, if, if there are maybe two, three people that might not know you that are <laughs> listener in our podcast. Right. And um, so if you would just give a short introduction about yourself, where you come from. And right, right. Um, yeah, so I guess um, I come um, 
Uh, geographically, I was actually born in uh, Russia, now 37, almost 38 years ago, uh, but I didn't live there for a long time. I lived there for 10 years and then uh, my parents moved uh, initially to, to Germany, to Hamburg, uh, where my father worked at uh, DAISY because he's a particle physicist. Uh, and then uh, shortly after that, when I was 13, 14 years old, to Sweden, where I lived for basically most of my life until moving to Germany uh, for work-related stuff and kind of really liking it in Germany. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of my geographical background. My uh, educational and scientific background is uh, such that I am already at school very much like the physical, initially the physical sciences, so I liked the mathematics and physics in particular, so I chose to study physics and mathematics at university. Uh, I was very close to doing a PhD in mathematics at one point, uh, and then by chance ended up uh, meeting a very inspirational person who was actually, and turned out, uh, then later became my PhD supervisor Roman Zubarev, uh, who uh, offered me an opportunity to do a PhD in his group, which was really a key turning point in my career. Um, and uh, after doing my PhD in Uppsala in Sweden, I then uh, again very much by chance ended up at a company which I didn't intend to because I intended to stay in academic research, but I ended up in a company Salzum in Germany which is located actually here also at the MBL campus um, and then uh, roughly seven years after that uh, and this time much less by chance but really by intent I uh, ended up at uh, MBL where I am now and where I actually very much wanted to be. So I work here as a principal investigator and as Dominic already pointed out uh, I'm heading a research group and I'm also heading the core facility uh, and um, um, it's a fantastic and demanding job and I very much enjoy it. Cool. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. I didn't have much to say myself. That's actually good if you get the important talking already. Um, so you said that you were, were already at school really much interested into phys physics and this kind of stuff. So was it also kind of derived from your father because you said that he worked at Daisy and he was a particle physicist or just did it develop like by yourself? Did um, I, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I um, I don't know how it is typically for people. I Growing up, I really didn't want to end up doing the same thing as my parents. So actually, I was very much set against getting a PhD in physics or anything like that. That's that was, why you chose mathematics. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but uh, I, I guess growing up as a small kid, there was a certain very clear influences. So basically my mother also has a PhD in physics and my grandmother, since I was a very small kid, was telling me mathematical riddles, uh, which I very much enjoyed. And I think when uh, I was five years old, I at one point told her that I understand all of mathematics because I saw the pattern in two her riddles and I could uh, I could always answer them. And then I actually thought that I understood everything and then it turned out not to be true. Um, but uh, so, and I was also at a young age, I was actually very much interested in literature and uh, things like that, but uh, in part also because of moving really, because I, I moved from Russia and then I learned a new language and then I moved to Sweden and then I learned again a new language um, and uh, uh, so also this kind of, in some way it precluded a career in, I guess, humanitarians uh, in humanity sciences, because actually I really didn't know any language sufficiently well to do that uh, at, at, an, at an early time point. Uh, and I guess also the other thing was that I, I did always like mathematics uh, even though and physics, even though I didn't want to be exactly like my father. Um, I just, you know, had a certain talent for it, so it, it came easy to me and I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, but I, I can't say that before starting university or even when started university, I, I'm, I was on the path to become a scientist. So I didn't have that focus. It was really more at that point, starting university and the first one or two years at university, there was more a path of the least resistance. So it's basically things that I was uh, that I were good at and I wanted definitely to go to university because I also very much liked all the things around the university. Um, uh, but uh, I, I can't say that that initial step was really 
uh, kind of with the aim in mind of doing a PhD and you know becoming mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, whatever. So that, that 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 happened more or less in the in the third year of university. I even quite distinctly remember. So it kind of at, at, at around that time things started happening in my head, and I got much more motivated. So before I. I liked uh, doing what I was doing, or I liked studying because, in part, because I came, I, it came pretty easy, and I got the satisfaction from understanding things. Uh, it's it's a vain and stupid thing to say, but I got some satisfaction from understanding things uh, faster and maybe better than uh, average people, than people on average. I mean, it's a stupid reason, but I think that's often in life. That's why people do certain things because they find that they're better. In those things than the it's average person. Always a bit of competition. Competition. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't even say it's competition. It's just uh, it's, it's it's a nice feeling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's just yeah. a satisfying feeling that, yeah. you, or also maybe that you get something that you can explain people. And yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. for example for me. I really like when I get something and then somebody asks me and I can explain it to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's kind of that really good satisfaction. So it kind of just makes you feel good. But uh, I would say it was really at my third year at the university because I was starting getting deeper into certain things and I was uh, and and then. I started really appreciating much more what I was learning and what I was understanding and the subjects etc and at one point it was, it was a very strange thing actually because it was at a mathematics course and the teacher um, Leonard Salling actually was his name, was a really great mathematics teacher, uh, he was explaining the differences between uh, Uh, countable and uncountable infinities, and uh, I found uh, an experience in such a beautiful way, um, in such a graspable way, and yet it's, I mean, the the subject is kind of uh, essentially not that graspable to the human mind, really, uh, that uh, it made me really kind of, uh, almost at that point, but there were things leading up to it, really appreciate science on a whole new level, and actually made me at that point really motivated to get much deeper into science and pursue a career in science, so I actually made an active decision at that point to pursue a career in science okay yeah. cool actually it's, it's really nice that you can like pinpoint it almost to one like one lecture that's really interesting so you started as a physicist mathematician kind of and now what is the research that you're actually doing now because i know that selsam is not a mathematician company mm. it's a proteomics company and you're also mm. now heading proteomics core facility and the rpai in the field of proteomics mm. so um what but what, what are you doing right now actually Because right. prote proteomics is also wide, it's, it's a big area. Yeah, proteomics is a huge area and uh, um, uh, I feel f quite fortunate that I started in the area. So I'll ask you, I'll answer your question, but I'll get to it through indirectly. Kind of. I, uh, I felt very fortunate that I started in the area relatively early 2004 and back then really proteomics, uh, it did... It did deserve the name proteomics, but it was still, uh, in terms of uh, what it could do, it was still quite limited. So there were really exciting technological developments, uh, but the application, in my opinion, honest opinion, to biology was still very limited, and you really kind of have to had to search for them with a flashlight to to, to find uh, an area where you could actually solve some biological problem with proteomics, in my opinion. Uh, but that has developed tremendously uh, for several reasons. Like we can now assay a much larger part of the of the proteome, and uh, we can do it in a much more quantitative way, which was really essential. And we can do it in a way where we, when we compare many different conditions in one go. And in recent years, I was working with developing technology, basically developing proteomics technologies for determining the mode of action of uh, of uh, small molecules. And small molecules is a kind of a larger class of what also encompasses, uh, for instance, marketed drugs. And um, I think that notion might uh, may become as a surprise to many people. Um, so there's two points. So uh, a drug, uh, so most marketed drugs are developed in such a way that they inhibit some protein which has an aberrant behavior in a disease model. So you want, to, and when you inhibit this protein, it cannot can no longer do its function. And in a specific disease setting, that's a good thing because this this uh, can uh, lead to improving uh, the health of an individual. Um, and that's how many drugs work, but uh, the surprising thing is that actually that m many drugs uh, do not only inhibit the, their target protein, uh, which is relevant in the disease, they also inhibit quite a large number of other proteins, um, and uh, which those proteins are is actually not known. And this is why many drugs that people take cause, can cause severe side effects, 
And also, uh, what might also come sound very surprising, many drugs actually, uh, quite a few drugs on the market uh, work in certain diseases, but we don't know why they work. We actually don't know what is the mechanism of these drugs. So we actually don't know which protein these drugs inhibit. And uh, so, and that question is something that uh, I've been working on uh, with some really excellent people of. Over recent years, and uh, recently, a couple of years ago, I found myself in a very privileged position to be able to play a key role in developing a novel technology which could, uh, uh, which could determine which proteins drugs interact with. <coughs> and <coughs> basically, this involved um, uh, determining the thermal stability of proteins inside the living cell. Um, with and without drug treatment and the physical premise of this co- still a little bit kind of uh, a pinch of physics left in my research uh, the, the, the physical premise for that is that when proteins bind a small molecule they tend to become more thermostable meaning that you need to heat them to higher temperature before they unfold and uh, and essentially melt um, and uh, this is something that we this I, we utilized this idea in combination with proteomics and made it possible to actually deconvolute the mechanism of several drugs and we also found some off targets and also some targets which can actually be which can explain some of the side effects of certain drugs but can also lead potentially to repurposing of certain drugs to other diseases okay so so basically um the, the both of the big statements or punchlines from that is that we industry mainly develops drugs that they know they work Mm -hmm. and they also know that they are not toxic for for the human body otherwise they would not be passing through the clinical phases Mm -hmm. but they sometimes don't have a clue how they work Mm -hmm. uh, or they think they work on a specific proteins but during the development time they kind of neglect they only focus on that protein that they on this target protein they are looking at and they also by because I mean, the cell is. Although we know a lot, and also with the gen- genome sequence, we know a lot what could be in the cell, but we're still kind of lacking information about how the cell is communicating in the cell, mm-hmm. and how many how the proteins interact. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of this is why, as one reason why the drugs work in a way that they work, but they, we don't know how they work, mm-hmm. or that they are also they are not only exposed to this one protein during the um, during, in the body, so they. Um, have just a chance in the cell to meet all the other 20 possible 20,000 proteins. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, and for example, um, special case, I think you worked a lot with kinase inhibitors. Mm-hmm. And kinases, you have 500 kinases in the human body encoded. And by def- since they all bind the small molecule ATP from in the body, that's, that's what they need. It's one of the basic substrate. Many of the small molecule inhibitors are designed as ATP uh, bind this ATP binding site and since this is really conserved they have just by default by design they have the chance to bind a lot of other proteins mm-hmm. yeah. and and you target this now in a really unbiased fashion so that you just have this chance and you just put the drug on the cells and it can just see seven eight nine thousand proteins and then you can buy the thermal stability shift yes yeah. So, yeah you can determine which proteins it didn't interact with. Exactly, and as, as Dominic correctly put it, essentially we worked with a technology which was doing that specifically for kinases, and then by actually extending, by, uh, not really even extending, but by introducing this novel technology, we actually almost immediately found out that quite a few kinase drugs did not only interact with kinases, but even inhibited other enzymes uh, in the in the human cells and uh, th- that actually these interactions could be causes of some of the side effects uh, seen with these drugs because as Dominic correctly points out drugs need to go through several phases and to show that they're essentially not too toxic mm-hmm. but they are still many drugs are still quite toxic they're just falling right below the threshold where it's uh, accepted uh, that uh, they can be used for treatment because it's so important to obviously try and improve uh, the uh, symptoms and uh, try to cure the disease uh, that uh, one tolerates at times some even very severe side effects. But by now being able to characterize molecules in a much better way in terms of which proteins they engage with, there is really hope that we in the future, uh, step by step, will be able to develop uh, safer and also likely more efficacious drugs. Or if it's not a safer, you can also think that if you know why it causes that side effect, you can just treat it. 
you can just add yeah. a supplement. Uh, might might be might be something simple like a vitamin that yeah. you, that the people need some more vitamins. Yeah. yeah. In this kind of way to treat the side effect. That is, as you correctly said, because we are talking about. Uh, drugs that are sometimes third line treatment and cancer so this mm. is almost that people have no other chance anymore and then mm. giving them some severe side effects that from like severe vomiting hair loss all this kind of stuff that you read about in the news this is tolerated because mm. you can give the people some more months or even maybe a year more of lifetime and this yeah. is kind of the balance and since life cannot be uh, accounted any price you take that risk yeah um You pointed so this would be like uh, elucidating side effects of drug, but you also said something about repurposing. What would that be? Right, um, right, and uh, this is again something um, for 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 some molecules you can find some very unexpected uh, cases. Uh, so, so you can have some very unexpected findings, and we had this recently. We had a study published quite recently where we. Uh, profiled, in fact, a cancer drug um, for which the known targets were, uh, the direct targets were, uh, no, or the targets that uh, were important for this particular cancer were known, and it was known that they were inhibited. And we actually profiled uh, this drug in an experiment where we just improved the technology that I just described, uh, just to more or less benchmark the technology and just to see that everything still works. And uh, but in that experiment, we actually had a very unexpected finding, and that was that actually this drug inhibited um, a metabolic um, uh, enzyme called uh, phenylalanine hydroxylase, which is uh, responsible for converting phenylalanine to tyrosine in the human body. And if you have mutations in this in this enzyme, you get a disease uh, which is actually quite well known called phenylketonuria. Basically, most infants are checked against uh, high phenylalanine levels in order to to find out whether they have this disease, ergo this mutation in this gene. Um, so that explained, uh, firstly that explained uh, some of the uh, some of the side effects that are seen with the drugs, so provided a very likely explanation for that. Uh, but uh, secondly, uh, actually uh, um, it turned out that it might be uh, a plausible treatment, so the inhibition of this enzyme, which uh, is the cause of this disease, in a different disease setting, which is called tyrosinemia, uh, this might be, uh, it still remains to be proven, uh, but there's uh, literature around it uh, which really suggests that, It might be a strategy for treating people who have tyrosinemia, which is basically um, an, uh, a metabolic disease where you have mutations in enzymes downstream of the tyrosine metabolism. Um, and uh, it turned out that people even had been looking for an inhibitor for this specific, specific enzyme, but it seems really that uh, so far there was no known small molecule which uh, inhibited this enzyme in a potent and relatively selective way. So in this uh, kind of lucky finding that we had, we actually found the first ever molecule which really inhibited this enzyme and we could also show in in vitro assays that it really inhibited its activity and we could also show by metabolom metabolomics analysis that it, it inhibited its activity. Um, so this is what I mean by repurposing. So uh, just also to be clear, it's you know it's not a magic wand. It's still always a very long road to b walk. So we see we see this uh, potential for for this particular molecule, and um, this will be followed up and looked into. But of course, all these experiments will take quite a bit of time, and mm -hmm. we'll see how this turns out. But in principle, th these are the kind of findings that this technology can enable, and uh, then hopefully in the long run lead to novel therapeutic strategies for, for other types of diseases. Yeah. And the advantage is would be if you have like a drug that is already approved and on the market you can repurpose it. You have basically mostly done all the clinical studies part of the toxicity yeah. already. So it can be get, get kind of a fast track. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, you already pointed out um, that you worked in a technology field, so you developed a new technology to study mm -hmm. the molecules. So um, proteomics is in general a really technolo technologically um, driven field. So mm. we, I mean, I, I experience this every day in my daily work mm -hmm. by taking care of the mass specs here <laughs> in, the, in the facility. <laughs> And um, with a lot of joy, I have to say, of can be quoted on that. Um, And so, what what you, what is your feeling? I mean, you have you started in 2004. I think this okay. was the, roughly the time when the Orbitrap starts to get introduced, mm -hmm. um, which made a huge impact on proteomics in general. Mm -hmm. um, but where do you like on a technological way see or in general 
either on the biochemistry essays, like mm -hmm. something like you did, or in the technology way on the mass spec side to give us more protein coverage in shorter time. Um, where do you see the, here the perspective in broader scale of proteomics? Right. Um, so I think um, I think it's a very exciting time because I think now the recent years have uh, made it uh, obvious beyond a reasonable doubt that proteomics is a can be very powerful technology in biological research because in terms of um, what we can get now in terms of protein coverage and the quality of quantification is actually um, a very useful starting point for uh, for developing and this part basically requires creativity for developing um, uh, novel technology that can give us insights of how actually the cell or drugs, etc., work. So that's at the point where we are at now. Um, but at this point, we still need really a lot of dedication, and we need uh, professional people um, and uh, highly educated people, um, and a lot of constant effort to actually be able to produce this uh, th these high numbers in terms of quantified proteins, and also to get good quality of quantification. So it's very much still, it's, it's still, you know, it's not an, it's still not a field for an amateur. It's not something that you can buy a machine and put it there, get a one week course and then uh, start producing uh, reproducible high quality data. Yeah, demands but still a lot of experience. Demands, it still demands really, really a lot of experience, which basically at this point in time precludes, uh, precludes uh, proteomics from uh, making, starting quickly making a broad impact in the clinic. So in, in my personal opinion, this is something that we should overcome in the next uh, few years uh, as a field to basically become more and more robust and more and more reproducible and I guess also more and more standardized on, on, um, on several aspects of proteomics so that we can, you know, uh, basically because uh, I said many good things about proteomics but it can still be that, you know, if uh, a big hospital is interested in doing uh, and doing uh, setting up proteomics assays for uh, for getting clinical data, and they call two independent experts. They might tell them two completely different stories. So, what is the best way of doing that? Yeah. Um, which, in a way, you know, I mean, might be okay, but it, it does kind of it, it feeds a little bit still potential mistrust in people, especially if the two mm -hmm. experts will say that what the other one said is crap. Uh, it can happen. Can happen. Yeah, it can. Really, this this thing, type of things can really happen, and so we need to kind of as a field become more, uh, I guess, robust, standardized, and uh, um, yeah. I guess, I guess these are really the key points for moving into the clinics. Um, but uh, and as I already said, we can already now get uh, with uh, really uh, given the right professional people, we can get very good coverage and very good quantification, and and this sets an excellent premise for actually developing very innovative technologies, uh, and also um, gives the opportunity of uh, also innovative creative thinking of how to apply these technologies in order to better understand. Um, in order to better understand uh, basically living systems or how, f for instance, the cell works. So that that is kind of my, my outlook at this point, that uh, on the one hand we need to get more robust and standardized in the future, and on the other hand uh, there's a tremendous room now, I think, in proteomics for creativity and coming up with great ideas and which these ideas Exactly which these ideas will be is, of course, hard for me to say, and I just hope that I will have some of them myself. <laughs> you had already quite some some of them, so yeah, um, yeah. You already talked about clinics, and you already uh, proteomics in clinical research. I think this is something that, in my opinion, is currently really much driven also by uh, by vendors, because since the proteomics is a really um, a technological based uh, field, there is a lot of interest from from companies in selling these instruments and I think they are I mean there's a really nicely stated proteomics is without any doubt a really good tool for 
um, biological research. Mm -hmm. And so you, you just see that by more and more proteomics facilities or proteomics labs popping up in every kind of university, even in the little ones that couldn't afford that some years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, in my opinion, this is something that, that uh, um, vendors also kind of like to push in because they see a new market. Mm -hmm. But um, that's just my opinion. I don't want to make any, you any statement about that. But I think this is just um, what, what I observe also on conferences. But um, but I think in the future, so what would you think that uh, proteomics could be useful? In, in, if you take all that kind of stuff away to, in terms of reliable, experienced people, if we, just, if we just come to the point that proteomics gets uh, like uh, push the button and go for it, mm -hmm. field or application in a standard way, mm -hmm. where do you think could be the strength in clinical research for proteomics? Because Western blood, if you just want to me measure, uh, monitor one marker, mm -hmm. I, I think then it's, you're better off still with a Western plot with an established one because it's just quicker and maybe also more sensitive. But would it be, would you see it in like in the day in, day out diagnostics? Or do you really think it would be something that you could do aside to gain more, like, like the people do now with the sequencing? That they try to sequence every patient they get in to get more sequencing data. Do you think this is something that, that proteomics could do? Um, uh, I think if it would come to a point where you push the button and you you get uh, your full proteome, uh, I think that that will be something one could do. And ideally, I mean, in a kind of very futuristic extrapolation, this is very far from reality. It's ideally because the proteome is very dynamic. Uh, your, your genome is quite it's static. Yeah. I mean, you 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 can have somatic mutations and whatever. But I mean, essentially. Your, your genome is much more dynamic. Your proteome changes a lot. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, given the right analysis tools and given if everything happens on the push of a button, what one probably should do <laughs> or could do is basically record one's own proteome, you know, more or less every day and monitor the changes that, that are observed in the proteome. Um, which uh, could really be uh, because that's also the thing, the general thing with uh, uh, with uh, biomarkers, etc., and why they're so hard to find. They're quite they differ quite a bit from person to person. So if you have a biomarker A, and uh, if it, uh, according to the FDA, is a biomarker which, if it goes up, uh, you know, to to such and such values, predictive of such and such disease, for instance. Um, uh, there's a huge standard variation and it might be that this biomarker A in person uh, person X is typically in a healthy state at a very low level and in person Y it's at a much higher level in a normal state but when both person X and Y get sick uh, the biomarker in uh, both cases would triple in its intensity mm -hmm. um, and so if you would have your own protein as a reference point, you could basically uh, tell quite clearly that uh, something happened and you should now seek help. But if you, uh, if you just monitor the level of this biomarker, then for instance, person uh, X who, who has a low level of this biomarker always compared to all other people, even if his level would increase by threefold relative to himself, he would still not uh, pass the border for what is uh, required uh, um, for calling uh, him to be in a danger zone. Yeah. Um, so th this uh, time resolved aspect of uh, personal proteome uh, would be an extremely powerful thing if this could, would be something that could be obtained through a push of a button. And uh, I think that would really would have the potential to revolutionize uh, um, uh, revolutionize uh, basically prediction of early onset of disease potentially. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was also a really nice outlook already, what could happen. And um, so coming now to the end of our interview, because I also don't want to take too much of your valuable time. And um, it's, I would like you to share something. So coming back to some more personal on a personal level, I would, maybe do you, is there some kind of anecdote or something that, that comes to your mind that was like, um, let's call it the most funny or moment that in your career so far that, that something happened or that, I mean, 
or how you made uh, maybe you I mean we all know the story how how penicillin was discovered by discovered by a mistake. Is there was there something in your career like that that you you already said by chance for by this technology you, you, you um, could repurpose or potentially repurpose this one drug you were talking about? But is there something a coincidence that happened uh, that you that you can remember? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, something that it's probably easier to see more objectively at an old age, or <laughs> if, maybe if I would ask uh, the future, <laughs> the future Misha, the future Misha, or someone close to me, or maybe ask my wife, <laughs> <laughs> um, because she she probably can tell lots of anecdotes about weird behavior. <laughs> <laughs> um, No, it's really hard to say. I mean, in general, there's a lot of uh, serendipity in science, uh, of course, and uh, and uh, things happen very often in a way that you don't expect, and then things work out in a different way, and then it turns out that it's actually a very exciting development. Whew, uh, a specific turning point. I mean, uh, for, uh, for me, I guess it was just... Uh, um, I mean, really, also some some lucky turns, but I, I don't really have a specific anecdote associated with that. But it's already nice to know, to to also tell maybe people that maybe there are some people listening to our podcast that are in the starting of their scientific career, yeah, and that it's already nice that for them to know that nothing can so they can up can end up in something completely different that they don't even know about yet. Just by coincidence and little turning points, being at the right time, at the right, t at the right moment, or the right place, and yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's 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 a good thing to keep in mind. I think one. I, I mean, I think in order to kind of you know um, have successful stories and things in science, one one does have to be. A, lucky but the the thing is that uh, so what what one has to be what what one has to do in order to be lucky is to be very curious and very attentive to things that happen around you and also being very open minded um, because like i said sometimes things don't work out in the way that uh, you think they should be working out or Uh, or one is too focused on one thing and then one takes a step back and looks around and one sees actually a, a completely different thing which is actually much more exciting than the thing that one was looking for. So um, I guess that would be my general recommendation for for for, uh, for a scientific career is to try to be as open-minded as possible and not to and not get to And really try not to get too narrow-minded and too over-focused. It's very good to be focused, but not not over-focused on a too small a thing, basically. Um, I wish I had some better anecdote, but uh, I guess that that would basically have to do. No, no, but I think it. As I said, it's, I think it's already nice to know that that the life, like maybe life is maybe get a bit more dramatic now. That if you say like life is full of little anecdotes that mm. leads to lead us to be here mm. at this right moment. Mm. And I think some of them are funny, some of them might, might be not. And mm. um, yeah, but as I, I already, so thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and thank you for only, your time. Maybe yeah. it was really nice talking to you. I mean, we see each other every day, so we don't need to pretend that we'll never see you again. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Live long and prosper. <laughs> 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 okay. You might want to do some editing. <laughs> Sorry? You might want to do some editing. Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think it was really great. It was really nice. Oh, thanks. Okay, good. That's always tricky. Um. So, Dominic, thank you very much for this interview. It sounded like you had a lot of fun there. <laughs> It was really a lot of fun. It was it was really funny to talk about the stuff with him. I mean, he is normally when you you realize when he when you get him talking, he he has a lot of stuff to say that made yeah. made it actually really really easy for me to do the interview. Great. So then I would say that without further small talk, we head on to the next interview that you performed. In that interview, you spoke with Professor Herbert Chochner. And he is head of the chair of biochemistry three at the university, University of Regensburg. And he is the speaker of the 
SFB 960, Ribosome Formation, Principles of um, RNP Biogenesis and Control of Their Function. And you talked about how to get a SFB, which is short for Sonderforschungsbereich, started at the university. So how he came up with the idea and how he got it started. And and also about the challenges um, when applying with for a SFB at the, Deutsche, at the DFG, which is the Deutsche Forschungsgesellschaft. So that's the place where you get the money for Makes for sense. such things. And I think you you were you said it in, we will say it say it in the interview, but I think you were even part of that Sonderforschungsbereich during your PhD yes, thesis, exactly. right? I was part of this, and I was also part of the yeah the Graduate uh, Research Academy, which was also part of the SFB. And in in this function, I was part of the renewal after the first period um, of the SFB. Okay, which was cool. then successful. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, because of you, not. <laughs> Not only, but <laughs> okay. That was a small, so let's a very get small the piece of you. Yeah, yeah, let's get it. Cool. So I'm sitting here with Herbert Schochner today, Professor Herbert Schochner, and thank you very much for joining uh, me today and being available on such so short notice. Um, I just want to give a short introduction to you because your time is very limited. So you started your um, scientific career here in Regensburg at the Institute of Biochemistry One in 83 and graduated in 87 and then uh, you went on uh, to do your postdoc in uh, Roger Kornberg's lab at the Stand Stanford University right. uh, and then uh, you came back to Germany uh, as a research assistant and then as a group leader in Heidelberg mm -hmm. correct and then since 2003 you are now a C4 professor here at the Institute of Biochemistry 3 at the University of Regensburg and you're also um, speaker of the SFP 960 um, that's right. <laughs> that's right. The title of this SFB, I just want to add this, um, is Ribosome Formation Principles of RNP Biogenesis and Control of Their Function. So thank you very much for being available. And You're I welcome. wanted to um, ask you, uh, when you started, or what did like um, fire your interest in biology in the beginning? What made you start with biology to study it? Well, there were many aspects. I mean, I think the, the starting point was uh, that I was always interested how um, the body gets the energy. So um, being a, a sportsman, I always yep. wanted to know uh, what gives you the power that you can do this kind of sports. And then I, I always was very interested in mountaineering and And uh, by own experience, um, going to high altitude, I wanted to know why you are not so efficient anymore doing sports in high altitude. And then in, at the same time, um, we had this, this uh, topic in school, the uh, biochemistry topic about energy uh, yeah, exactly. uh, consumption and so and and, and this draw my, my interest towards uh, biochemistry and that was one of the, the reasons why I wanted to study biology with uh, a main focus on, on, on biochemistry. Oh, really nice. That's very interesting. So when you started then at the university, did you have in mind that you wanted to end up as a professor or did you just like open mind and go to the university and see where it takes you or did you have this? Mm, not at all. I was always interested in Uh, many different aspects in, in biology. I was also interested in, uh, kind of, uh, zoology and, and, uh, step by step, I, uh, thought what I c c can do. And, um, then you get somehow pushed in, in this career, um, knowing, well, this is an interesting, uh, project you want to, to work on and, and, um, I, I never thought about my my career in three or four years oh, I see, uh, in I see. advance. So what made you then decide on doing a postdoc with uh, Roger Kornberg? I mean, the reason was that I uh, my PhD work ended in uh, a gene regulation problem. So I, I worked on um, um, this green algae, uh, Volvox cartary, And this was a, basically a cell differentiation project, but the, uh, trigger 
was a, a sexual pheromone which was produced by the the male species and to add this uh, sexual pheromone to the algae uh, reprogrammed um, the the genetic um, differentiation and so the, this uh, um, ended then in in the question well what is going on in in regard of uh, transcription and or, or gene regulation because the program was then completely different and then i started to read well what what are the models how genes are regulated maybe through uh, recombination events or by um, transcription factors and then i, I searched through um, um, the possibilities and then I uh, thought it would be nice to do work on a, on a nice model organism and at that time yeast was a, a very good uh, choice and and then I asked several people and uh, well Roger agreed that he will take me as a, a postdoc so I decided to go to California yeah, it's always nice to live there. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, well, actually, I could also do some mountaineering there. But this, this was another <laughs> point. <laughs> so then uh, you came back to, to Regensburg in, in the end uh, to, to make it not too long. And did you have in mind then already to like group together several groups to start an SFB? Or did you at that time or yeah make one step after another to maybe first settle yourself, get a nice group and then reach out to to start the SFB or? Well, I mean, Regensburg as a small university had, had always this tradition of a strong biochemistry and, and one reason that it had uh, this strong biochemistry was uh, a, a very long um, lasting um, series of, of SFBs. So when I came here, um, we very soon had the idea that we should somehow extend this possibility to get uh, a strong external funding. This was uh, one point of funding. And then and, and the other point was uh, from um, my experience in Heidelberg and also in in the United States that the modern science is, is more and more um, going uh, through teamwork. You need a good team and uh, uh, first a good team and second you need really good equipment and for the equipment and also for a good team you need money so um, this is the reason why you try to get a more um, uh, uh, financing to get uh, really good grants and since there is this possibility here in Germany um, to found a, a scientific network through this SFB. We went for an SFB. It was a, a, a long effort um, that this worked out. There were uh, several unsuccessful steps, but in, in the end, we, we were successful. Yeah, this was one of the points that I also want to tackle. Like, um, what were like the obstacles that you came across when you want to like, I mean, it's a huge amount of money and now I guess there are Correct me if I'm wrong, like about nine or ten groups, or how much is there in the SFP now? Right now there are 14. For 14, exactly. 14 so, so what were like obstacles that you came across to like get together all those uh, groups to, to join this SFP? The, the question was now what? What what were the obstacles? So what, what kind of uh, problems did you have or what kind of... Um, things did you come across that yeah i mean the, the the problem is here the small university that you get the critical mass uh, to to build an, an sfb um, because you need at least uh, 11 or 12 projects which are all related together and and this is not so such a big problem at a a uh, university like Heidelberg or Munich because there are many Already a uh, lot of groups right uh, uh, a lot of groups working on uh, topics which you can um, gather in 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 such a, a network i mean the problem is that there has, has to be a synergistic effects otherwise you don't get the funding so everyone has um uh, to support the, the 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 other project leader and um the synergism is, is 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 one of the crucial points and this is not so easy to find these related projects in a small university so i guess it 
yeah, it took a long time to like from the first idea to really get everybody on track to form this huge uh, yeah so network, so right? we we started out from a research group which is also a, a network but a smaller one so it's like and the this, first step of sfp or dfg funding right yeah this is <coughs> the first step of dfg funding and um, you need only between maybe uh, six and nine uh, project leaders and uh, this was easier because i was lucky to have uh, really good co-workers so in in general we are um, working together in this chair with uh, several independent group leaders and each of these group leader had his own project so we gathered together and um, so the the chair of biochemistry three and in addition uh, a project for the microbiology then an external project um, this was basically the the research group and this was a crystallization point then for the sfp and the, the you need uh, a good recruitment for of, of new professors yeah of course <clears throat> so you have to convince the faculty uh, who should be recruited to to support um, uh, the scientific uh, focus and at the end we we got uh, then 12 projects uh, to oh, really nice to apply so the, i guess the success rate of like applying to such a big uh, sfp grant is not that is it like successful or is, is it likely to get it when you have like when you apply to it or how would you consider this is it um it, it's a tough uh, work and a competition so it, it, this uh, implements several steps so i think the most crucial part is uh to uh, go to bonn and and have these um what what is it in german it's vorgespräch a it's, it's a preliminary evaluation and there are the experts and and uh, you discuss with them very long so you have first uh, of course to write a short proposal and you have to indicate already which projects um you would think would would match and but then you have this this very intense discussion with with the experts and when they say then well you have a good chance for uh, for an sfp uh, then um, you go home and you are happy and <laughs> then the work starts because then you have to write the the real proposal right? so then given that you are really successful and you get your first funding <laughs> then you have the chance like to extend it i guess twice right so mm -hmm. that's it. the first funding period is about four years then you get reevaluated. then you have the chance to extend it for four more years and you're in the second period now right and then i was part of the revision for the after the first period and then you have the chance to renew it again for another four years so in in total in it total. must be about 12 years 12 years yeah so what are the the, the problems then or what do you have to do to like get it extended? I mean, yeah, you have to be access successful and have to have like do good work and have to have a good output, uh, obviously. But um, what would you think that would make the reviews then? Yeah, well, you have to keep the the people on track. This is the most important thing. They have to show that uh, they do successful work. They have to to publish their uh, results. And then if an SFB is successful, you have several people who apply for a different position and then they are also, um, um, they have good chances to, to get to other universities as a professor. So it's a really successful uh, SFB um, releases uh, project leaders, which is a problem because uh, of you course, need to keep them obviously. Uh, on the one hand, to keep them, and then on the other hand, if they are gone, you you have to recruit new ones, which is always a fight. Then, um, well, you have to be attractive, or uh, uh, the faculty sometimes have other interests. Uh, so this is not so easy. And then, second, the the DFG has some formal. Uh, criteria. Uh, one is that uh, you need a certain balance of uh, gender, so you always have to have some female 
uh, group leaders, uh, which uh, is not always very easy to get them. And uh, the other point is that that you need uh, young group leaders, so they have to be only a certain time after their uh, graduation and, and this is also not so easy because they have a very high turnover they have to leave and then you need uh, new ones okay so you have you have three uh, you're yeah, part of three projects in this sfb and i uh, want to go to the more science side now but since we don't have too much time can you maybe yeah tell us something about one of the projects like maybe your most favorite one but i don't want to <laughs> put uh, put like the point of view and uh, yeah can you tell me something about like one of your projects real short like what are you doing and what well i mean the, the title of the sfp is still ribosome formation yeah. and this uh, i think was always a very strong point of of uh, this sfp that all the projects are sorted around the, the ribosome and and uh, of course my my favorite Uh, project is uh, concerning the RNA polymerase one. So this is the machinery which synthesizes the, the, the ribosomal RNA. And uh, what we want to know is what are uh, the specialities of, of this polymerase. Why does a, a eukaryotic cell need three nuclear RNA polymerases instead of one which have the, the bacteria or also the archaea? And um, um, we would like to see this specialization on a on a molecular basis. So, w why has the polymerase certain subunits which are um, uh, different in in the other two RNA polymerases? Why is the RNA polymerase so much more efficient than than uh, RNA polymerase two? Um, so these are questions in which are interested. So and just when I arrived, you also were in the lab. So is this something you, I mean, that you do regularly or is it just like now because it's Christmas time, you, you like to go back to the lab and uh, perform experiments like once a year when Christmas approaches or? Yeah, yeah basically <laughs> I'm doing it when Christmas is approaching and, uh, approaching and I, I always uh, say it's, it's a therapeutic pipetting what I'm doing because I'm really not efficient anymore in that. But uh, actually the time before Christmas is always so stressful that uh, it's good to, to keep the balance and go back to the lab and do something <laughs> uh, with your hands and this relaxes me a little bit. But uh, uh, on the other hand, it's still very exciting yeah, to, to to sit there and see uh, uh, the result and then to think about the result. And uh, uh, this is still a lot of excitement. What you don't have if you are just talking to your co-workers and uh, this is work, more yeah. a personal experience. So since you want to go to the back, back to the lab uh, again, I just have two more questions. So um, what do you think would be like the future trends in the in the uh, field of RNA biology? So where do you think in general the field is moving? So what are like? Well, thing? I mean, right now we have all these um, structural possibilities. Um, so uh, doing cryo EM we can uh, get very high resolution structures of these RNPs and the next step is now to see really the dynamics or what is the reason why a structure is is formed and I think this is one of the n the next uh, topics which are uh, very interesting and and the other one is to to see it on the on a single molecular basis so right now we are in, uh, except the The, the, the structure is of course a, a single molecule device, but um, if if you are looking at the function of of uh, such machineries, we have always an average, and we would really uh, uh, like to see a single molecule how how this is behaving, and and I think this is also a tendency for the future. So, great. And the second question was like, what kind of advice would you give a student that is starting now in the university or is in school now and wants to go to the university and like uh, study biology or should they even study biology? Of course they should, but what kind of advice would you give them if they... 
Well, the advice is that, I mean, this is more in, in, into uh, their nature. They have to be excited about science. You have, they have to be curious. They have to be interested uh, about um, experiments, results, uh, which are published or also which are in the lab. So I think uh, this is the most important thing. There are so many different interesting questions, whether this is yeah. RNA biology or um uh, cell differentiation or neurobiology uh, uh, but the interest the in enthusiasm this is the most important thing so i always to want want to find out the next thing and go on and see the results and then want to find out more and this is like and then you will be successful anyway because you will find your way right yeah definitely it's it's not so easy to plan this kind of career with, because you need always a lot of luck doing the experiments yeah. But um, I, I mean, if if you uh, are enthusiastic and and um, have a strong effort, um, there is also a good chance to to advance. So then, um, thank you very much for joining us today, and I My will pleasure. Get, uh, let you get back to the lab and <laughs> uh, do your nice experiments, and hopefully you are lucky and get a nice result. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. So Stefan, thank you very much for this very nice interview. And uh, it's quite, kind of interesting that, that the guy is then uh, said he is hitting back to the lab. So actually he's still performing experiments. Yeah, that's great to hear. Not, not something really usual for professors. That's what they usually do. Okay, so now that was the second interview for this episode. Um, and we are already hitting straight to the end, which means that we hope that you liked what you heard this time, that you liked this kind of special episode. We are hoping and planning to do this more often, kind of this interview series in the new year. We will be back with a regular episode in, on the 1st of February, plus we, with yet another special episode for our one-year anniversary at the Super Bowl Sunday. And see if you might like to tell what we are planning for doing there. Uh, what what do we plan? Yes, so we we get together every Super Bowl Sunday. So this is an annual thing, and this is when we started last year. So this year we thought maybe we could, as we see each other there, we could do like a little little, little experiment. So maybe we will, or not, not maybe, but we will do a Facebook Live video. Hope this works, uh, and uh, we will do like isolate DNA from, I guess tomatoes, or I don't know. Yeah, I guess tomatoes. <laughs> And uh, everybody who wants to join us will could join us uh, on Facebook, or we also try to have a live stream of the podcast and uh, yeah, stream it live. But uh, this uh, depends on Ultraschall 3.0, so hopefully this will be out there. Fingers crossed, and then we will uh, yeah probably do this. So we will. I don't know uh, if you want to uh, participate in this experiment. Uh, I don't think would you. Know, do not need much, but I guess we will um, publish the things you will need in the next episode because I do not have it on hand now. <laughs> <laughs> or we will just put it out on Twitter or something or on Facebook. And then, yeah, we will try to isolate DNA in like 15 to 20 minutes from uh, tomato. So this will be so great. we will make a, a true gene-free tomato. Yes. So we for all the people that don't like genes in their food... <laughs> and we will, we will put genes in our ep podcast episode once more. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. But apparently, so you said that you that we are going to publish a list of things that people need to follow us. Um, so this is actually something that you could do at home, right? So yes, you really could do so. You, what you need is like a knife, a tomato, and something to uh, scramble down the tomato to make it small. And then you need uh, some SDS or some, yeah, yeah, some SDS to, to detergent, right? To break up the cell walls, and then you will need uh, alcohol it's con as concentrated as possible to um, isolate the DNA, and then you're all set. So this this is everything you need. Cool. And maybe a little bit of salt, but yeah, we will see what protocol we are following. And the butter so bread. <laughs> <laughs> to eat the other half of the tomato. Exactly. Uh -uh. Um, okay. So, thanks again for the interview, for the preparations here and everything and for putting out the news. And as usually, I'm 
closing the episode with a um, quotation and a quote. And this time I put one from Isaac Asimov, a science fiction writer. And he said, the most exciting phrase in science is not Eureka, but that's funny. <laughs> <laughs>